A reading from the Gospel according to John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that everyone who believes will have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not judged The one who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light so that his deeds will not be exposed. But the one who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds will be revealed as having been performed in God. This is the word of the Lord. Father, we come to you and you have ordained Uh, that we increase our faith, that we come through faith through the preaching of your word, and that's only by your uh, gracious and sovereign will for for someone to preach and for ears to be opened. And that's what we plead for, Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit to open our ears to your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So it is a little nice to be up here and not have to read the scripture readings before I uh, before I preach on it. Um, and so what will really help you this morning is if you open your, your pew Bibles or open your Bibles, uh, or if you're using it on your phone or whatever, and an app, and, and follow through in John chapter 3, they'll have it and, and other verses on the screen behind us. Um, but I'm going to divide this up into three sections, and, and we're going to go through it. And as we begin in chapter in chapter 3 verse 4 it says just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the son of man be lifted up and so this is uh, what I've mentioned before is what's called a metalipsis when the writer when John mentions this when Jesus is talking to the crowd in context he doesn't explain it except for you the next verse that says that whoever believes in him may have eternal life you as the reader as the listener are supposed to know the context to what our Lord is talking about. And uh, it's easy to read through this and, and, and just miss a lot of it because we don't have that deeply ingrained in our culture or in our, in our hearts or in our minds. And we read that and we have a little bit of an idea. And uh, we could continue but, uh, uh, and, and easily pass over it, but... Uh, that account is found in Numbers 21. I'm going to read it. It's only five verses. Uh, there's a lot of things, especially in the Old Testament, that are foundational to the scriptures that carry on. Like the Tower of Babel is, is a huge context for the rest of scripture, and it's only 11 verses. And it changes everything. And so our Lord is using this as a metalipsis that the reader would understand of, of how the bronze serpent, serpent was lifted up. And so if you go to Numbers 21, we're going to read in verse 4. Um, um, Well, I guess let me give a little bit more context. And when we get to this account in the Old Testament, this is after Moses was lifted up uh, in the wilderness, brought brought Israel out of Egypt through signs and wonders after Pharaoh had had been judged and brought through the Red Sea. This is after Mount Sinai, after all of Israel had received the law, after God had met with them in a pillar of, of, of smoke and fire, 
Uh, this is after they erected the tabernacle, after they got instructions. So they've got the moving tabernacle. God is in the day moving in a pillar of cloud and at night in a, in a, in a flaming fire. This is after they've received manna from heaven daily. This is, this is after Miriam and Aaron, and Aaron opposed Moses. Uh, this is after Israel has already rebelled two or three times. This is after Aaron's staff buds. This is after the spies already go into the land and bring back a report. Uh, and, and this is after Moses has struck the rock and, and water comes out. And so this account that we get, God has already graciously dealt and belabored with Israel a long time, or at least through a lot of accounts. And so in, in direct context, if, you've got, if you just read the headings in, in the Bible uh, that are in there, in the ESV or in other Bibles, we see that Israel is passing through the desert onto the promised land that the Lord uh, uh, prophesied and promised to them, and Edom doesn't allow them passage. They can't go through. They're asking, can we cut through here? It's a shorter journey. Edom says no. Uh, Aaron ends up dying, and they have to go around Edom, which is going to take even longer. And then we pick up in Numbers 21, verse 4. It says, from Mount, from Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food and no water, and we loathe this, this worthless food. This isn't the first time that they said this. This is about the third time that they said this, that they're getting impatient. They don't want to eat manna from heaven anymore. They're not pleased with what God has given them. They're not pleased with the way it's going. They're not pleased that they have to go around Edom. They're not pleased with the leadership. They're not pleased with a lot of things that the hand of the Lord has dealt them. They're not pleased with drinking water from a rock. They're not pleased with a lot of things. Verse 6, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents amongst them, and they bit the people, so that the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpent from us. And so if you go back through the book of Numbers, it's essentially a book about how Israel has rebelled against Moses and against the Lord, and, and he equates those. And before, if you guys remember Korah's rebellion, this was a, an insurrection, a rebellion that sprung up, and they wanted... They weren't happy with Moses' leadership and God working through him, and so they wanted to go back to Egypt. They wanted to go back. They'd rather be slaves in Egypt than free men under that leadership and under what the Lord has provided for them. But in this account, it seems that they are a little bit aware because when Korah rebelled, God made a separation. He said, okay, you want to see something cool? You want to separate? Everyone who wants to follow Korah, go over here. And everybody who wants to follow Moses, go over here. And about 1 p.m., you're going to see something cool. <laughs> and what happens? The earth opens up and swallows those who want to follow Korah and want to rebel, who were not content with the, the hand that the Lord has dealt, and they wanted to take uh, matters into their own hands. And even before that, there's a rebellion where he sends uh, fire and various things in, in the midst, and, uh, and with both rebellions up until this point, Moses has to stand in between the people and God to absorb or mediate God's wrath. And God is always having a mode of which there's a mediator to absorb God's wrath or stand in, in the way between God's wrath and the people. And it seems like the people are a little bit more aware that they're getting... Uh, it says fiery serpents, these are poisonous serpents, that they're biting people and they're dying. This is a little less uh, miraculous of a judgment than uh, the ground opening up and swallowing people, but it seems like the people are realizing that, yeah, this is God's judgment on us. We are discontent, we are rebellious, and God has sent serpents and they're biting us and we're dying. That's not good. That's not where you want to be. 
And so they came to Moses and said, Moses, you're the mediator. You stand between us. Please pray for us that we may be saved. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, it wasn't just like, yeah, I'm going to pray. And then all is going to go away. There's going to be another mode of mediation, another mode of, of in theological terms, of propitiation to, to stave God's wrath. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, and if a serpent bit anyone, he would look to the bronze serpent and live. And so when we go back to John, our Lord is saying in the same way that these people looked to the bronze serpent is the same way you would look to the Son of Man and have eternal life. And, and so the first maybe question that should come to everyone's mind is, isn't the serpent bad? Why are we having this image in Scripture of a positive symbol of a serpent when we see in the garden the serpent was the one that deceived Adam and Eve? And all throughout Scripture, uh, we see the devil portrayed as a serpent, eventually in Revelation as a dragon. And so why do we have this positive symbol of a serpent? Why is Moses instructed to lift up a serpent? And why is Jesus comparing himself to a serpent. And so um, there's a lot of theories on this, and some of them would say contextually in the culture that uh, people around them believed that snakes had some kind of uh, divine healing powers, and so they were playing on that imagery. And I don't think that that, that could be the case, but I don't think that makes a lot of sense. Um, contextually, if you read it, it doesn't say directly how he lifted it up, but I think the best interpretation is to understand that the bronze serpent was pierced through in the, with a staff and a pierced serpent was lifted up. It wasn't a whole serpent. It wasn't a live serpent. It was, it was a symbol of the serpents that are killing you, that God sent for judgment, is, is pierced through and, and lifted up. And so, uh, even uh, they, uh, I remember going through um, uh, a law class in in uh, Reformation Bible College, going through Exodus, Numbers, all the the first five books of the Bible. And I'm not a scholar of Hebrew, but my teacher was, and he suggested that the Hebrew lends its way to understanding it this way. And when we translate to English, it just talks about being being lifted up. But when we understand that if the serpent was pierced through and they were to look on a pierced serpent, they were supposed to, the image that Moses is mediating that is supposed to come and stave God's wrath is that the serpent is going to die, that there's going to be victory, and you're looking towards a mediator who's going to kill the serpent. And our Lord says that this is the in the same way that Israel looked on the serpent, that we must look on the Son of Man to have eternal life. And this is one of many passages that shows us in the Old Testament that everybody was always saved by faith. There was no other way. There was never another way towards salvation. And so um, I've, I've mentioned this quite often, but the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10, I think it's verse 4, is writing and just says, as a matter of fact, don't, don't you know that the blood of sin, the, the blood of bulls and goats, can never take away sin? And so, even though Old Testament Israel had the tabernacle, had the temple, had sacrifices uh, twice a day, never was that to take away sin. Never could that take away God's judgment. Never could that stave God's wrath. It can't do it. It's just an animal, it's an imperfect sacrifice. It was supposed to be a reminder of sin. And one chapter later, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, uh, the writer tells us, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It's impossible. And so you could seemingly do the right things. You can go, and even in Israel, you can go through the Old Testament sacrificial systems, 
But that doesn't mean it's pleasing to God. That doesn't mean you're doing it and he's accepting it. That doesn't mean that you're doing it in a way that he uh, has ordained and enjoys because it's impossible to please God apart from faith. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And so you can't believe in one who you don't believe exists. You can't believe in one who you don't think is, is going to keep his promises and reward those who seek him. You wouldn't come to Christ if you don't think he has any reward for you. If there's in a very, um, uh, John Piper uses the word hedonistic, in a very self-pleasing way, we all come to Christ, right? I don't come to Christ because I think my life's going to get worse. Uh, I don't come to Christ because I see the depth of my sin and I think I can, this might uh, not work out for me, that it, you know. And, and so this is how God has always existed in relation to his creation, that it is always by faith that we come to him. We don't progress in sanctification. We don't come out of sins. We don't come out of various things. We don't grow in the Lord apart from faith. It's always by faith. And so simple outward obedience is never going to help us. It might seem like it helps us for a time, but it never does if there's not any true active, active faith. And so we have, in a lot of the evangelical Western culture, we have been influenced more uh, by a, a, a light gospel that says, well, if we get people in church and they kind of clean up a little bit and they, they dress a little bit better and they do good at their jobs, all those things are wonderful, but that doesn't save people. That doesn't actually help people for eternity. That we could put certain boundaries in place and we can set certain systems in place and we can get people cleaned up and in church, but in the end, it doesn't help them if they're not growing in faith, if, they're not, if they don't have an active, lively faith. And this is the way that the Lord works from creation. And so the next verse in John, when he says is, uh, in John 3.16, this is probably the most misused and misunderstood Bible verse, at least in the New Testament. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish and have eternal life. And we put that on signs and we take it to the football game and we hold it up. And that's our evangelism. And it's the, probably the most misused one because it's used in a way that says, God loves the whole world and that's you. And we say nothing about faith, nothing about coming to him, nothing about pleasing him or obedience, that God loves you. And, the, and it says he does, and so he does, but we leave it there. And so uh, God didn't send, it says here that even as we continue reading, God didn't send Christ to save the whole world particularly. The, it says that God so loved the world, the cosmos, this system, this world he created, that he sent Christ. Without Christ, nothing would be getting better. Nobody would be... Uh, um, nobody would be saved from their sins, nothing in creation, no systems, no, no families, no businesses, no education systems, no governments would be getting better without Christ. That's why Jesus says, go and disciple the nations, teach the nations to obey everything I've commanded you, because that's the end goal. That's where we're going. God didn't just say, well, oh man, that Adam guy sinned. It kind of threw a, a wrench in the gears. Let's start over. Maybe it'll be better the next time. No, he, he built it. He created it. He, he foreknew it and predestined it even. And, but he loves it enough that he's not going to let this world go to hell. And ever since Christ's resurrection and the inception of the church and Pentecost, the world has been getting better and better and better. And as people, and that's by people, Believing in Christ by faith, coming to repentance, coming to uh, obedience, being sanctified, and that's how the world gets better. There's no other way. We can't set up uh, in our government if we uh, currently, if you just 
look around for about 10 minutes, you might see that our Western culture is kind of taking a nosedive, and we can't just set up certain systems to, to pull the plane back up. It's only going to be by faith in people coming to Christ. And so this verse is often misused and misrepresents the gospel and the Bible say that God just loves everybody, and that's a very special love, and, and certainly he loves the whole, whole creation, but he doesn't love everybody particularly enough to save them. Not everybody gets saved. Only those, he says, that who believe would have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Right? That's not why Christ came, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And so God loves this creation and this world so much that he gives grace to everybody. Everybody who has life has grace. Everybody who has breath has grace. Everybody who, who has anything has grace, but not a particular salvific grace. And so, he, and so that particular grace comes to those who by faith believe in him. And so it puts us in a little bit of a predicament because we are born into condemnation. We are born under God's wrath. We are born into a world full of sin. And, and Romans 9 brings that out in verse 22. Uh, what if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessel, vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? That's where we are. A holy God can't receive unholy, imperfect people. We, outside of Christ, we don't have anything except for wrath prepared for us. Verse 23 in Romans 9, In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called from not the Jews only, but from also the Gentiles. And so going back to John, when he's saying that Jesus was sent in this world not to condemn us, because he didn't really need to do that. He didn't need to come to the world to condemn us. We were already condemned. He came into the world that we would believe through him, that we would be saved and that we would be vessels of wrath and that he would show his great mercy on us. And this is, this is why we preach. This is why we have a high view of preaching, and, and not just teaching and explaining and getting the right doctrines. And so uh, Romans, again, makes it clear that in Romans 10 that, that preaching is the primary, not the only, but the primary mode that God uses to bring about faith and increase our faith. And you can preach to yourself when you read the Bible. Obviously, if you read the scriptures, the, the gospel is there. You read it, you, uh, you can increase your faith, you can come to faith. But, it's, but Romans makes it clear that, that preaching draws you to Christ, that we need people to preach Christ to us. We need people to preach Christ to the world and not just teaching, not just explaining the right things. We could very easily get up here, or you could very easily, fathers, teach your children, or husbands, teach your wives, or heads of households, mothers, teach their children how to just be obedient. We could just teach on obedience. We can just teach on what the Bible says. We can just teach and explain the right doctrine and not necessarily do that in a way that draws our children, draws our spouses, draws other people to Christ. Right? We could do that from the pulpit. And it's very easy to fall into this mode where we just say, that's not what the Bible says, this is this and this is right, and not do it in a way that we are trying and praying and, and pleading that, that uh, we would be drawn to Christ. And so preaching is that mode that the Lord has ordained that draws us to Christ, that leads us to repentance, and it grows our faith. And then converts us to obedience. The obedience happens later. And, and, and so there's, a, a, there's this conversion in our heart that the God ordains words and the Holy Spirit empowers them that we would not just understand the Bible, not just understand what we ought to do, not just weigh how deep our sin is, but actually causes us to draw into Christ. And so it's, it's very easy 
in our household is very easy and we should examine ourselves. And it's very easy to even go out when we evangelize and just argue and, and use logic and use different apologetic methods and never call someone towards repentance, never call someone towards belief, never address the core issue of faith. And so when we um, get into the next verses in verse 19 in John, it says, and this is the judgment, right? God didn't come, didn't send Christ to judge the world, but here's the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And so this becomes very evident when uh, you go out and evangelize, um, when you talk to people, um, even when you talk to your children, <laughs> that they love the darkness instead of the light. And that's the judgment. And John is just reiterating what he said in, in chapter 1, is that Christ came as the light, he came to his own people, and whoever would receive him would become a children of God. And they'd be born of God, and they'd be born of not of the flesh and blood, but be born of the Spirit. But his own people rejected him. And anybody who, uh, who loves the darkness uh, won't come to the light, won't love the light, not because of disbelief, not because of, of I don't think there's enough proof or there's various things or logically, those do play into it. But it always comes down to because they would have to change. Their darkness would have to be exposed. Verse 20, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. That's the reason why Christians, we don't progress in sanctification as God wants us to because we love our sin, because we don't want to grow. We don't want to bring it to the light. That's really uncomfortable. We don't want to have to get outside accountability or anything. And we as Christians don't grow and people don't come to Christ. It's always because of, of faith, but it's because we love our darkness. We love our evil deeds. We don't want to, to grow. But whoever, whoever does what is, what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. And so this comes into play in Romans at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book, Paul talks about the obedience of faith. And there's a correlation to believing in Christ and then progressing in, in faith and really just this heart thing that's a little ethereal, but it's in our hearts and in our minds and in our spirits. And then our body is carried along by that faith towards obedience. And so uh, it's very easy when I meet with, with guys, either if they're struggling with pornography or pornography addiction or anger or apathy, or whatever, it's very easy to tell who's going to progress or not in about like 10 minutes. It's, tell me what's going on. Okay, here's the list of, okay, how much did you blame shift? How much did you hide it? How much is that real? And if they didn't come to the light, if they're not, uh, it's always if someone got found out, if there's a problem, whether they uh, blew up at their spouse or, or the pornography was found or there's, um, clear apathy or, or whatever, uh, it's always less progressive. There's less chances when it's found out, when someone else found it out instead of it being brought to the light. But even when they bring it to the light, you could tell in about like 10 minutes, 10 to 30 minutes of how much they're going to actually grow by how much they want to walk in the light. And so that includes outside accountability. That includes setting up boundaries. That includes if you have a, a anger issue, that you have to set up these, these, and these boundaries. And if you have a pornography issue or if you have a lust issue, you've got to set up these, these, and these boundaries. And if they say, well, that's a little extreme, I know that it's like they're not going to go that far. Or I don't want to do that. I don't want to apologize to my wife every time I yell at her. That would be extreme. Well, you're not gonna, they're not going to make it too far. And... It's, it's very easy to tell when the Lord brings in the correlation here in these scriptures between faith and works, between those who first want to, who, who by faith, uh, come and believe in Christ, and if they want their works to be exposed. If there's darkness in them, none of us are, are like Christ in such a way that there's no sin. None of us are, are totally free from sin, so we still have 
evil deeds, darkness, and how much we want that to be exposed and come into the light is how much we will uh, progress in our sanctification. And like I've talked about in the last couple of weeks is, is that at the, on the other side of that, when you hide your darkness, you get darkness. You get more darkness. When you come to the light, you get more light, which it says is Christ. And that's the motivation. And so I don't get up here to preach that, that we should all just have a really high motivation for sanctification and doing what's right. That's skipping steps. That's later down the road is if your motivation isn't Christ, like I can come, I could hate my sin, I could hate lust, pornography, anger, whatever, and, and expose that to light because I want free from that. And my whole life I'm going to have to set up boundaries because I never came to Christ in the midst of that. I never came, I, I brought the issues to the light, but my motivation wasn't Christ. And so my whole life is just trying to do what's right and trying to do what's right and carrying this burden and trying to obey the rules. And it's very burdensome and it's, it usually only lasts for periods of time and it waxes and it wanes until you get tired of it. But if your motivation is Christ is on the other side, that's what Christ says. I've came for freedom to set you free. Set you free from the darkness. Set you free from all these, these bondages and, and sins and to have true life, right? Eternal life, when Jesus says, when you come to me, all who believe will have eternal life, that doesn't start when you die. That starts when you believe. And so, um, so when we have obedience issues, it's not that we have... Uh, it's not the, what the Lord's getting at is not that we have issues where we just have to get steered on the right course. It's always a gospel issue, a matter of faith. If we're going to come to Christ, if we're going to believe in him, and he'll bring certain things in our life, certain issues, certain sins that we've struggled with for years that he presents to us or, or, or finally opens our eyes or gives us motivations to be tired of them. And the issue isn't whether we're going to set up boundaries or systems. The issue is always whether we're going to come to Christ. And so obedience happens later. As you come to Christ, the, the, the obedience, as he transforms your heart, transforms your mind, the obedience happens later. And so as we come to the table this morning, when Christ said that he didn't come to condemn the world, he came to save it. And how he does that is by being lifted up by a crucifixion. The one that as the serpent came, as the serpents were biting, Christ, or biting the people, biting the Israelites, the same one that, that the same judgment that was coming on the people was the same judgment that the mediator was lifting up, that there's going to be, the serpent was going to get pierced. The serpent was going to get destroyed. And it didn't happen how we would have liked it to happen, through a, a military victory, through a, a, a strong king coming through and, and, and destroying the evil one. He did it by taking that evil on himself. He did it by himself being lifted up, himself being pierced. And so that's why we do communion weekly to remember that, that this is how, this is Christ's mode of victory, Crucifixion, death. That's how he gets the victory. <clears throat> and he invites us to that every week as we come to the table and we look at his as symbols of his, his, his blood and his body. And, and it's not an obedience thing. It's not the same way that if we just take it, we receive grace. It's he's calling us to come to him by faith. That's why... Corinthians, 1 Corinthians talks about that it's the same cup. Some of you are eating it and eating a judgment and discipline from the Lord, and some of you are eating a blessing from the Lord. And it's all by faith. And out of that faith uh, uh, comes obedience. But that's what Christ is calling us to in the table is, is to come by faith. Be reminded that Christ is the victor. Christ is the one who wins. Christ is the one that crushes the serpent. But he does that through the cross. 
And so come, let's dine with Christ.